and welcome to The Eclectic Humanist, episode 13. Once again, I've been a little longer between episodes than I really intended to, and uh, this is a trend that I hope won't continue. In any case, today I would like to wrap up the little series I started a while back on the rise of Christian fundamentalism in the West. And I think I want to do so a little differently than what I'd originally had in mind, which was to devote this episode, this final episode, to a discussion of Christian dominionism specifically. I think instead I'd like to just talk about what have come to be called the culture wars, what these mean, especially, I guess, during an election year, an election season that is hopefully drawing to a close on the uh, on the other side of the border. Because I've had some thoughts over the last few years about the overall tenor of of the social discourse involved in the so-called culture wars, how virulent it's gotten as gradually the demographic of North America and particularly the United States shifts away from white Christians, particularly white evangelical Christians, being the dominant political voice in that country. That is, I think we're coming to a crossroads. I think everybody in North America knows that one way or another, whether you're politically tending towards the left or tending towards the right, whether you are religious or like myself, not just uh, an atheist, but someone who is actively committed to reducing the influence of religion and government. It's very clear that what happens in the next little while, what happens in the next few months, hell, what happens in the next few weeks is desperately important for the question of whether, whether the United States survives as a secular republic and as a citizen of, of a country living right next door to that particular madhouse, what effect that will have on my country, on, on the world that my daughter inherits. That said, uh, a little bit of a commentary on dominionism or dominion theology or reconstruction theology, if you prefer, is probably in order. This is a fairly recent development. The founder of the movement is a guy by the name of Rouse's Rush Dooney, whose 1973 book, Institute of Biblical Law, called for exactly that, the instituting of biblical specifically Levitical law in the United States, that the United States was called by God to lead the world to Christ and that Christians were called by God to lead the United States to Christ so that it could f fulfill its world mission. The term dominion theology comes from a passage in Genesis. It's Genesis one twenty eight, where... Yahweh gives Adam and Eve dominion over the world. And this is, as many of you probably know, a radically conservative, radically reactionary political form of religiosity. As much, maybe even more a political philosophy than, than a religious one. It is an American, particularly American form of, of extreme extreme fundamentalism, which of course has all of the usual vices of, of your garden variety fundamentalism. It's anti-science, it's anti-feminist, it's homophobic, and it tends to appeal more to Old Testament justice than to the notion presented, for example, in Luke's gospel of loving one's neighbor as oneself. That tends to get lost. Reconstructionism also embraces American exceptionalism. As I said, it sees the duty of American Christians as leading first America, then the rest of the world, to Jesus. And honestly, <laughs> of all the possible nightmares facing American, North American society, I can think of very few worse than that. The object of dominionism is to seize control of all social institutions. You can see this, for instance, in, in the actions and policies of Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos, 
herself affiliated with dominionism as as was phyllis schlafly as are rick perry michelle bachman ted cruz mike pence kellyanne conway a number of these folks are associated with uh, an organization called the council for national policy which is a, a christian conservative organization with a strong dominionist angle in any case what i was saying was the objective one of the objectives of of dominionism is to seize control of the various mechanisms of culture including education and we can see from devos's policy even from early on in her in her tenure as secretary of education and i use that word in quotation marks where she is concerned in stating outright that her objective was to lead lead the nation closer to christ or as she says our desire is to confront the culture in ways that will continue to advance God's kingdom. And hell, that was 2017, a time that, speaking in October of 2020, actually almost looks like the good old days. But seriously, uh, in terms of education, almost half of, of Americans currently believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old. The cosmos is less than 10,000 years old. I think the most recent numbers I've read on that one were about 40%. There's no country in the so-called first world with a higher concentration of, of evolution deniers, climate science deniers, anti-vaxxers, flat earthers. So the undermining of the education system, the undermining of trust in the scientific method, the conclusions and implications and applications of science has corrupted the intellectual character of American culture to the point where I don't know how long it will take to recover if it ever does. But I didn't come on here to be all doom and gloom. I actually in many ways feel quite optimistic. One of the reasons for my optimism, which you probably can't hear in my voice right now, I'm tired. We're all tired is that I follow the polls of religious membership and have been doing so for a very long time. And there's a very long trend right now of people, particularly young people, leaving religion. Leaving religion because they see the religious right for the hypocritical authoritarians that they are. And they are quite properly disgusted with the inhumanity of so much that has come out of the politics of the religious right over the last few decades, their parents' generation, the grandparents' generation. So the trends, the numbers, are against the theocrats, are against the dominionists. But of course, this brings its own danger, doesn't it? And we can see this in, in the vehemence and the aggression, the dishonesty, the hypocrisy with which the religious right is trying to push forward its anti-choice, anti-feminist, anti-LGBTQ, anti-science, anti-environmental agenda, while it still has time, why there is such a rush to cram a judge into the Supreme Court, a radical conservative Christian judge who is as backward looking as anyone that I can think of and who has said outright that she will place her religious commitments above her secular commitments as a judge while they still have time because I think it is true I honestly think it's true that that particular political philosophy that particular abomination has just about run its course, but having just about run its course is now fighting like a cornered animal and is therefore more dangerous than it's ever been. Because of course, they read the same numbers I read and they know their days are numbered. And if they want to establish the theocracy that folks like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, hell, Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, spent or spend their lives and careers practically slobbering over, they know they'd better do it soon or it's never going to happen. And, and what we need to do 
is just hang on to make sure it never fucking happens. But when I talk about numbers, what do I mean? Well, here are a few from the Pew Research Center. This is a, a reputable polling organization. They've been around for a long time. And these are aggregated polls. That is, these are average numbers from multiple polls from different, different organizations. And taking a look at religious membership between 2007 and 2019, which is the last year for which they have data, they show, broadly speaking, 78% of Americans identifying as Christian in 2007, down to 65% in 2019. That's a 12% decline in 12 years. Not bad. Over that same span, they identify the religiously unaffiliated, otherwise known as the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, as having increased from 16% to 26%, a 10% increase. Again, this is movement in the right direction. This is one of the reasons why I'm encouraged. But this isn't the only reason why I'm encouraged. Because these numbers get even more interesting when you break them down by generation. So let's take a look at, again, the most recent year, so 2019, broken down by silent generation, that is people born between 28 and 45, baby boomers, people born between 1946 and 1964, Generation X, my cohort, people born between 65 and 80, and millennials, people born between 1981 and 1996. Well, for the silent generation, 84% identify as Christian. Whereas for boomers, that goes down to 76%. For Gen Xers, down to 67%. And for millennials, down to less than half, down to 49%. On the other hand, we have those, uh, those adopting non-Christian faiths. Silent generation, we have 4%. Boomers, 6 Gen Xers, also 6 Millennials, 9 But where I think we see the most encouraging movement is in the unaffiliated, in the nuns, for which we have, for the silent generation, my parents' generation, 10%. For boomers, 17%. For Gen Xers, 25%. And for millennials, 40%. That's a huge increase. But as I say, I can look at those numbers and I can see a very optimistic picture emerging. I can see the hopes for the anti-intellectualism of, of recent years, of recent decades that I've watched unfold to catastrophic political consequence, to catastrophic social consequence, eventually being left behind. And the danger of that theocratic impulse, which I've been tracking in my actual real time in my real life since the 1970s, also evaporating, finally, finally evaporating. But if you are on the other side of that fence, you can also see the clock ticking. You can see your time running out. And as I said, with that ticking clock and that passing time comes the necessity of cramming through as much legislation as you possibly can while you still can, so that when numbers are no longer on your side, the law still is, the government still is, the institutions have been corrupted to the point where they can serve a theocratic interest. But of course, the ticking clock, the running out of time, is not a bad thing to every, to every conservative Christian. And I am differentiating here between conservative and liberal Christians. As I've said before, I respect liberal Christianity. It's, it's the religious right that I have access to grind with. It's the religious right that I see as, as, a, as a global danger. And part of the reason for that, a big part of the reason for that, is the embracing of apocalypticism by many, many American Christians, including many prominent American Christians. In an article published earlier this year in Post-Digital Science and Education and reprinted by the National Institutes of Health, titled Religious Nationalism in the Coronavirus Pandemic, Soul-Sucking Evangelicals and Branch Covidians Make America Sick Again, Peter McLaren points out, and I quote, 
Approximately 40% of American adults are biblical apocalypticists and believe that Jesus will, or likely will, return to earth by 2050. From the time that the coronavirus crisis first appeared on the shores of God's favorite piece of real estate, it became clear that it is comorbid with Christian nationalism, or to put it another way, Christian nationalism seems to be a co-occurring condition relative to pandemics that reach the shores of America the Beautiful. That is, from a point of view compatible with that of 40% of Americans, the end of the world is just peachy frickin' keen. And McLaren, of course, is not the only person to point this out. The rise of apocalyptic Christianity in the United States has been going on for decades, and it lies behind so much of the denial of environmental science. Why save a world when the world is under judgment and is going to be brought to an end anyways by everybody's favorite mythological figment? But environmental degradation is, as measured by the span of human lives, relatively slow, even though anybody with eyes and a memory can see it unfolding in their own lifetime. Pandemics are a little faster. And what the pandemic has done with, with American Christians is draw into focus, into a very precise focus, the indifference to questions of human well-being on the religious right. It's not what Christian nationalists, it's not what apocalyptic Christians are concerned about. If the world is going to end, why try to save it? If the world is supposed to end, according to your favorite mythology, don't try to save it. This, too, is part of the agenda of Christian nationalism, bringing about, helping to bring about the end times. It lies behind so much of the American support for Israel, which is directed not at securing the good of Israel, but about bringing the conditions for Armageddon, for that final battle which is supposed to take place in Israel, after certain conditions have been met, one of which is Jerusalem being solely in hands of the Jews instead of the divided city that it currently is and has been for quite some time. And I addressed some of those conditions in a previous episode on the book of Revelation. But as I said, I'm not just talking about large numbers of Americans and statistics. There are particular names, particular faces involved in this collective madness. And not even just the countless evangelical pastors who have, in defiance of public health, in defiance of the best medical advice, continue to hold services, continue to deny the science behind masks, as if they would like to be operated on by a, by a surgeon who is not wearing a mask. No, we have in the United States, not just in the United States, but that's what I'm talking about right now, a cohort, a powerful cohort of people. For example, Betsy DeVos, as I mentioned before, devoted not to the public good, but to working Yahweh's voodoo. Another one of these is Mike Pompeo, an overtly evangelical Christian. Secretary of State and Biblical Apocalypticist. Back in 2015, before he occupied his current post, for example, but when he was acting as the representative of Kansas's 4th Congressional District, a position that he held between 2011 and 2017, Pompeo addressed a, a large church in Kansas in explicitly apocalyptic terms while responding to the Supreme Court's decision to legalize same-sex marriage in the United States, something against which right-wing Christians continue to agitate in their drive to have no one but them actually possess the freedoms that they claim to prize so deeply. We will continue to fight these battles. He said this at the Summit Church in Wichita, Kansas. It is a never-ending struggle until the rapture. Be part of it be part of the fight. That is, the denial of, of marriage equality is for Pompeo and for many, many on the religious right, uh, a sacred duty that they will carry to the end of the world toward which many of them are actually working. Uh, Pompeo, of course, is not limited in his, uh, in his biases and animus to LGBTQ people. He is also accused all Muslims of being at least terrorist sympathizers 
and has, in his position of CIA director, had the following to say about Islamic terrorists, that they will, and I quote, continue to press against us until we make sure that we pray and stand and fight and make sure that we know that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is truly the only solution for our world. Now, that is pure dominionism right there. And as for his relationship with Trump, and I've been putting off talking about this, actually wondering whether and how I should go about it. Pompeo once suggested on Israeli radio that the current president could be serving a function similar to the Jewish queen Esther, who, when married to the Persian king, urged him to resist the advice of his evil advisor Haman to kill the Jews, and thus saved them from, from extermination. Well, Pompeo went on to say, as a Christian, I certainly believe that's possible. And as long as we're talking about that part of the world, I may as well refer to Diana Butler Bass, who did her PhD dissertation at Duke on American fundamentalism and grew up fundamentalist herself. So she has both an academic and an insider's understanding of this particular cultural phenomenon. And she says, there are these particular prophecies from Ezekiel where there is talk of war that will happen at a very important moment in Israel's history. And that war is going to kick off the end times. People in this prophetic community believe Iran is going to be one of those aggressors. When Iran gets in the news, especially with anything to do with war, it's sort of a prophetic dog whistle to evangelicals. They will support anything that seems to edge the world towards this conflagration. They don't necessarily want violence, but they're eager for Christ to return, and they think that this war with Iran and Israel has to happen for their larger hope to pass. That is, a scholar who is both a recovering fundamentalist and, and someone deeply versed in the, in the politics and ideologies of, of end times eschatology is being very upfront about what apocalyptic Christians in the U.S., what rapture Christians are aiming toward, what they want, what they're hoping for. And this, of course, reminds me of pictures that I'm sure you've all seen as they've gone around, and there are many different versions of them, of, of evangelical pastors actually physically laying their hands on, on Donald Trump as if he were the instrument of their God's divine plan to bring about those end times, to bring about the end of time, the end of the world by 2050. And yes, this is dangerous. People with those beliefs are dangerous. They need to be fought. So these two visions of time come together right now in a particularly dangerous configuration. Numerically, time is running out for those wingnuts, and they know it. But on the other hand, they want time to run out. Not just for them but for everybody. That's what apocalypticism is. That's what trying to bring about the rapture is. A desire for the end of time. A desire for the end times. And this is not new to me, and this is not new at all, as I've said. This has been going on as a mounting tide in conservative American Christianity for decades now. And yet, as I said a few minutes ago, I'm optimistic at least hopeful. And not just because the demographics have turned against the religious right at long, long last. I'm also hopeful because I, I know history. I'm hopeful because of the things we discussed in episode one of, of this little series, because of the scientific revolution, because the human intellect, the human drive and capacity to know has shown itself sufficient to throw off superstition, to throw off mythology, to, to throw off the, the false meanings that we imagine descend from above and instead find meaning in ourselves, to embody the meanings that arise naturally in our lives, that arise out of our functioning as human beings. I'm optimistic because after a thousand years of suppression by the church, suppression by religious authority, that human capacity to know, to understand, found itself again, and in that time has 
increased human knowledge exponentially and increased human lifespans and increased our understanding of ourselves and our cosmos to the degree that no, no previous society had been able to achieve. This is what humans do. This is what human brains can do when set free from the shackles of religion. But as we've talked about in the various episodes in this sequence, that freedom is scary because that freedom comes at a cost. It comes at a cost that there is no absolute knowledge. Well, we can rule out certain hypotheses, rule out that which doesn't align with observation. We can never say absolutely that any given proposition is true. And for those who, who lack the strength to stand, the intellectual balance to stand on that shifting ground, to tread those waters of uncertainty, the old myths offer a strong temptation. And that temptation, I think, gets stronger and stronger. The more complex, the more involved, the more intertwined our society becomes. Now, most cultures have managed to get by okay. Most cultures have managed to put those old mythologies, if not completely behind them, at least on a shelf where they can do minimal damage. At least most so-called first world cultures have. The United States is not one of them. The United States is, is anomalous. But this also, I think, is changing. Whether it's changing fast enough remains to be seen, because, of course, the causes of that intellectual stagnation, that intellectual retreat and, and, and corruption, are deep and long-standing. The education system has been systematically undermined. We're never too far between attempts by creationists to try to get their favorite stories into actual science classrooms. There are teachers all over the United States, not just in the Bible Belt, who, although they're supposed to teach evolution, make very clear that they don't accept it, that they don't understand it, and will often simply save it till the very end when there isn't time to teach it properly and just tell the students to read it on their own time. But I'm hopeful. And this may sound strange, but one of the reasons I am hopeful in the long run is the ongoing disaster that is the American response to coronavirus. Evangelical Christians from the beginning have been leading the retreat from reality in the United States, and that retreat turned into a charge into fantasy when this virus showed up, and the Trump government embraced that fantasy, embraced that active denial of, of expertise, of, of knowledge, of science, of medicine, by trying to control the narrative, by cherry-picking the occasional source so it looks like there's some credibility for, oh, I don't know, not social distancing, not wearing masks, not actually going into lockdown when we know damn well it helps. But people are seeing the consequences of that now. They're seeing their families die, and this is horrible. But they're also learning the cost of denying reality. They're learning the cost of placing belief above fact. I wish they didn't have to learn this way. But if they don't learn this way, they're, they're going to learn when their cities flood, when their farms dry up, and when they can't feed themselves. But of course, on the other hand... Apocalypticism, or any religion, provides a narrative, doesn't it? It provides a context in which we can mean something. And we all have a desire to mean something. That's a deep, a deep drive in the human psyche. And that meaning something is something that the scientific revolution has challenged, has utterly destabilized, forced us to rethink. The Copernican model wasn't rejected because it was wrong. It was rejected because it took us out of the middle. It made it seem like we meant less. It took us out of the very comfortable position that, for example, in Genesis and most other myths, is defined by us being, if not center stage, damn close. Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake, not because he was wrong, but because the idea of an infinite cosmos threatened to reduce the meaning, the significance of humanity to near zero, which is where it belongs. But never mind right and wrong. He challenged the myth, and he paid. He challenged religion, and he paid. Galileo was shown the implements of torture that would be used on him if he didn't recant. 
not because he was wrong, but because he challenged the myth. He challenged the centrality of humans in the divine plan, and he challenged the power that that myth gave people in authority. He challenged their control. It is no coincidence that rejection of evolution by natural selection is an almost entirely religious phenomenon. It is not based in an understanding of fact. It is not based in an understanding of reality. It is an example of what we call motivated reasoning. Exactly the kind of reasoning one should not do when one is trying to find out the truth, but the kind of reasoning a lawyer would do. Having already signed on to a particular case and simply being left with the job of constructing an argument to make that case seem compelling. This is not a concern for truth. That evolution denial comes almost entirely out of religion, should tell you whether you are an evolution denier or not, something about the level of honesty, of intellectual honesty, of that position. People were offended by Darwin, by Darwin's arguments, not because they were wrong, but because the idea of their being descended from a different ape or a monkey was repulsive to them. It challenged their sense of who they are, of, of what they meant. And we haven't even talked about Big Bang cosmology yet and the notion, the very well-established position, that the observable universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Where does that leave us? Where does that leave us in the Genesis myth, where even if that having dominion over the world that, that Elohim commits to us in Genesis 128 actually doesn't mean rulership so much as stewardship, well, what does it mean to be a steward of a speck of dust in an infinite void? I'm comfortable with that question, and I would say any truly intellectually modern person is also comfortable with that question, but the religious right is not. And why the appeal, why the mass appeal of end times theology or theologies in the modern U.S.? It's not just the modern U.S. Of course, there have been end times theologies before. For the last 2,000 years, Christians have been saying the end is right around the corner. At least they're consistent. But why is that so popular now? What's, what's the psychological force that that particular approach to Christian mythology has? I have some thoughts on the matter, and I may as well share those because that's kind of what I do here. And these thoughts, for the most part, are not going to be new to me. You've probably heard some of them before. Modernity is hard. It's hard to be a modern person. And I don't mean physically hard. Physically, it's not that hard compared to what it's like to be a pre-modern person. We live longer. We have more comforts. So fine. whoop de doo It's still hard intellectually. It's hard psychologically. Because this isn't the environment that we evolved in. This is, we're living in a world that we've made, not anymore in the world that made us. And... The world in which we live is increasingly complex. Complex in ways that I can't even pretend to fully understand or even recognize. And that I suspect no individual person can. There used to be a phrase, the Renaissance man, a person who was a master of all of the arts of culture, be they the sciences or the humanities. It's not possible to be that anymore, not in the full sense of the word, because there's just too much to know. One person can't, one brain can't hold all that knowledge or even ask all those questions. That is, there's a degree of ignorance that a modern person must accept, that a pre-modern person didn't need to, wasn't even aware of. When the world was just small and the cosmos revolved around us, we didn't even know that we didn't know most of what was out there. We had no idea. Now we have an idea. And the emptiness between those stars and a realization of how long it takes light to travel between one star and another that are relatively close to each other, and all of that void in between that is most, most of, of what is out there, that can swallow a psyche whole. And the old myths 
They provide a, a comfortable retreat. They provide a meaning that descends from the heavens that when an astronomer looks up or when a person with an understanding of astronomy looks up, presents space, presents time, presents a blackness into which you can easily fall, but presents nothing transcendent because we have no evidence of anything transcendent. And we hunger for meaning. And those stories give us meaning. And, and it's not even just that. Because quite frankly, I get that particular appeal. And probably many of you do as well. I love end of the world movies, end of the world stories. Love them. Absolutely love them. Can't get enough of them. Why? I've, I've had to ask myself this. And, and this is where I think I can maybe get some common ground with um, people who think they're living in, a, in, a, in an apocalyptic movie, in an end times movie. What's the appeal of, of, of apocalyptic fiction? Well, I don't know about you, but living in a world I don't understand and, and that is complex beyond my ability to grasp, in which, at best, I can only hope to be a small and very forgettable part in a pageant that doesn't mean anything and is performed for no one, and that will be forgotten. If I had any particular desire to be remembered, that would probably bother me. And the desire to simply wash everything away, start fresh, as in the flood myth, is understandable. Because, of course, we all imagine ourselves still being here. We all imagine that we're not the ones who die, that we're not the ones who suffer that we get the reward in the end, whether the reward is continuing to breathe and confront new challenges that are not going to the office, doing your job, paying your rent, and the endless train of drudgery, mostly performed for other drudges, that typifies so many people in modern life, so many people's lives in the modern world. To cast that off, and even if briefly but heroically struggle, to establish or maintain a meaning that is threatened with being lost, but in whose rightness you have absolute confidence, that's got to be, got to be satisfying. And because, of course, in your imagination, you are always one of the ones who lives, well, that must mean also you're one of the righteous, mustn't it? It means you're on the side of the angels, the side of the gods, which is where we all want to be, even if our gods are dark. So the appeal of turning the entire world into this apocalyptic stage pageant is understandable. To make your myths real, that may even seem creative, it may even seem worthy. Obviously to many it does, to 40% of American adults who think Jesus is coming back by 2050. This seems like a good idea, as I said. But as I also said, this is dangerous. It's dangerous because if a person truly believes that we are living in or near the end times and, and that the end not only is but should be coming, then we may assume a common ground that doesn't exist. When I speak to another person, when I speak to a group of people about what I think ought to happen, the way I think the world ought to be turning, my presumption is always that human flourishing is central to the argument. Human flourishing in this world, or even better, the flourishing of, of other sentient creatures as well. But if that's not even on the table, then despite using the same words, we're not talking the same language. That's the thing that worries me most. But as I said, I am hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful because humanity has grown out of superstition before. And while there's been a mass retreat, particularly in the, in the U.S., back into these, these old superstitions, these old fantasies, we've seen people do better. We've seen that country do better in the past than it's doing now, much, much better. And what we can see is the young people who are seeing, seeing that for what it is, for the road that they don't want to go down. Because of course, well, I'm thinking of my daughter right now. I, I, I can't not think of my daughter in conversations like these. She is turning 13 on the 17th of this month. I will officially be the father of a teenager in a few days. Well, that means in 2050, she'll be 43. What's her world going to look like? Well, if these apocalypticists have their way, it'll be ending. I don't want that to happen. And I'll do everything I can to prevent it from happening. And I hope you will too. I know most of you will. Because you want to live. You're not insane. And even if you are a Christian, you're not 
caught up in that end times mythology that is driving people away from reality, seeking some meaning beyond themselves. But of course, the next question that we need to ask is, well, what can we do? How, how do people, how do small people go about the small business of bringing the world back to reality? And here I need to underline that it is a small business. I don't think there is a center stage, just as there's no center to the universe itself. And I think that smallness as well is worth dwelling on. Ultimately, cultures are not shaped by the big moments, by the big gestures. They're, they're shaped by the individual actions of, of people living in them. Yes, those big moments and big gestures influence the way things go. There, there's no way they couldn't. But they're not the defining moments, or rather, they're, de they're the defining moments that are easy to arbitrarily anchor onto, but very often by the time they happen, the change has already occurred, and it's occurred at the grassroots level. So how do, how do reasonable people stand against the politically powerful forces of apocalypticism against the emotionally compelling forces of apocalypticism, especially when the economy is taking a nosedive when people's futures, actual futures, are, are uncertain. And where they are clear, they are often unpleasant. How do we avoid though, those temptations of just, of just burning all this shit down and starting again? Which is another version of apocalypticism, by the way. And, and, uh, and you hear that in the political discourse as well. It's just smash it all down and build it up from scratch. That's, that is not what you want to do. That, that always, always involves bloodshed, real world bloodshed, even if you're not supposedly striving for some transcendent hereafter. But as I said, the, 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 the texture of a culture arises from the intersections of people. It arises from our relationships, our day to day relationships with each other. Or as Wordsworth has it in his wonderful poem, Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey, which he published in 1798, such perhaps as have, he speaks of feelings and sensations and pleasures and, and the day-to-day -day interactions of human beings. Such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. When I was younger, when I was 18 and I first encountered those lines, I hated them. I just hated them. I was full of myself, I was full of my own significance, of the grandness of everything that I wanted to do and the primary colors in which I still more or less saw the world. But now, having lived, well, having lived longer than up until 1900 was the average life expectancy even in developed countries, that is, for most of human history, Somebody my age was more likely to be dead than alive. Having reached that point in life and having had the, the privilege of, of living through and, and subsequently forgetting most of that time, I recognize what Wordsworth is getting at here. Our grand narratives are not real in themselves. They are, as are so many other things, such as probably consciousness itself, Emergent properties, they come out of a lower substrate, a more fundamental substrate, the way a pattern in a woven fabric will emerge from the intersections of threads of different color, or a picture in newsprint will emerge from individual dots, conglomerations of individual dots that in and of themselves seem to have nothing to do with the picture, or the way that an image on a screen will emerge from pixels that disappear completely if you're going to see the image, that get swallowed up in the context of the image. Or if you zoom in on them close enough, you can see them, but you can no longer see the image. This is a nice way of looking at the way our consciousness works, at the way our societies work as well. And this is why, no, I haven't wandered too much, this is why I find hope in the small things. Because it's all small things. Even the things that look big. Our Gandhis, our, our Martin Luther Kings, great in themselves, but also reflections, or if you prefer revelations, of what, of what their societies were already in the process of becoming. And this is how I see the situation right now. 
messed up as it is. And again, I'm not the first person to point out that Donald Trump is more symptom than cause. He is a revelation of what American society has become, or is in the process of becoming, or could be on the road to becoming. And his most unwavering supporters have been the religious right. So Donald Trump is also a revelation of what the religious right actually is, counter to its claims of righteousness, of what it actually is. If we define what something is by what something does, and I think in the arena of politics, that is the best definition that, uh, that I can come up with. You can espouse all the ideals you want. It's what you do that counts. Well, what does the religious right do? They vote for Donald Trump. They support his lies. They support his misogyny. They support his authoritarian stances on politics. They lay hands on his repulsive self, treating him as an instrument of the divine. And you will encounter the argument that God often works through flawed instruments. Well, blah, blah, woof, woof, that's just another excuse. Just as they made excuses for the Stormy Daniels affair, among other things, while a couple of decades earlier they had been screaming for Bill Clinton's head. Their values, their espoused values, seem to be nothing but a smokescreen. It's no coincidence that people tend to find the God whose values line up with what they want anyway. You look at the religious what right and what they do, and what you see is what they want anyway. Their God is just an excuse. Similarly, you look at decent Christians, you look at the humanitarian efforts that many Christians undertake, and you see there as well what they want anyway. You see the metaphor of God being used to exercise their own innate decency. Or on the religious right, you see the metaphor of God being used as an excuse to exercise their innate depravity. So as I asked before in slightly different words, how does a person, how does a decent person stand against that level of depravity when, when the depravity in question holds a fair bit of executive and legislative power? And as I said as well, my hope is not in the big stuff, but in the small stuff, because we're all small stuff. And it's okay to be small stuff. Nobody is obliged to be anything else, and I honestly don't think anyone is even capable of being anything else, socially constructed illusions notwithstanding. So, at a time when basic human decency is a political act, and right now it is, arguably it always is, right now basic human decency is a conspicuously political act especially in a country where people who are protesting systemic injustices are being described as terrorists, while actual terrorists are able to walk past the police after having shot people. In that environment, in an environment where the president, rather than publicly condemning an attempt at a right-wing coup in Michigan, a kidnapping and possible murder of the governor by right-wing militia, uses that as an excuse to condemn so-called Antifa, that is to condemn a group that has nothing to do with anything he's talking about. In an environment like that, decency is political. This may sound small, it may sound unexciting. This is where the apocalypse narrative has an advantage. It's fucking exciting, man. It really is. Decency, basic human decency is boring, but it's political. It's always political. What you do always affects the body politic. And to not be pushed into compromising that decency in the face of gross indecency itself, that is political strength. That is, that is, that is integrity. And it is integrity more than anything else that the religious right as currently manifested lacks utterly. As indicated by their voting patterns, by their public behavior, and by the excuses they have been willing to make for the abuses of the Trump administration. So again, why be hopeful? I am hopeful because, as I said before, the demographic tide is turning against the religious right simply because they are being revealed for what they are. This was already happening 
before the Trump administration. And as came up a couple of minutes ago, Trump has served as a revelation as to the true character of the religious right, the true character of these dominionist political opportunists, these theocrats who would reshape the world's first secular republic into a theocracy if given the chance, and they are being given the chance. So as we come up on what is really the most important election in my lifetime, beyond any doubt, we see the United States being asked, having had four years, to look in the mirror that is Donald Trump and see yourself. Is this what you want to be? Having had four years to look in the mirror that is Donald Trump and see the undermining of education, the undermining of real religious freedom in the name of some fundamentalist parody thereof, the undermining of the social security network, the undermining of environmental protections, the undermining of medical care during a fucking pandemic. Is this what you want to be? And to any American listening to this, the very simple answer to what can I do is vote. Vote as if your life depended on it, because unless you are rich, it probably does. Vote as if your republic depended on it, because this very well could end up being the last genuine election in your country's history. Do not let the religious right push their agenda through. Do not let the discourse of reason, of evidence-based decision-making, be submerged under an ideology of hatred, repression, anti-feminism, homophobia, and corporate greed propped up in the name of some parody of morality of decency, when actual decency, the treatment of human beings in ways befitting the dignity of human beings, is in real jeopardy, not just in the U.S., but in the West. So vote. And if you know someone who needs help casting a ballot, help them in any legal way that you can. And if for some reason you can't cast your ballot early and must go to a polling station, go in numbers. Take people with you to vote together because there will be Trumpist thugs there under the guise of maintaining order, but whose real job will be to harass people who don't look like the kind of people they want voting. Go in sufficient numbers to feel safe and get that motherfucker out of office. Get those theocrats the fuck out of office restore decency and genuine democracy to your country become something other than a global threat a rogue nation and a laughingstock vote that is how you fix this and on that note i think it's time for me to be done if you've made it this far thank you so much for listening as i mentioned a couple of episodes back this will be my last hour-long episode, at least for the foreseeable future, so that I can get back to getting episodes out on a weekly basis instead of whenever the hell I can find the time juggling my teaching schedule. So I hope I'll talk to you soon. I hope you found that your last hour has been well spent. And if you want to find me, if you want to get a hold of me online, of course, you can find me at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com, at eclectichumanist on Facebook, and at echumanist on Twitter. So until the next time, when I post a shorter and, I promise, less political talk, please be kind to each other. Mm -hmm.